Welcome, and thank you for joining us for today's Dealer on Webinar, How to Stop Dirty Data and Start Making More Profits. My name is Eliana Raggio, and I'll be your moderator today. And today's webinar is being presented by Dealer on. For anyone who isn't familiar with Dealer on, we're an award-winning website development company and digital agency, best known for our amazing SEO, the best customer service, and the highest converting website designs in the industry, including the award-winning Chameleon Responsive Website Platform. We've been awarded the Driving Sales Dealer Satisfaction Award for top-rated websites for an unprecedented sixth year in a row. We also took home the AWA Award for Best Websites three times. Plus, FCA announced that we're now an approved vendor. We're still the only company in the industry that offers a money-back lead guarantee program. Hey, do you want to know more? Yeah, you do. You can check us out at our gorgeous brand new Dealer On website at DealerOn.com. When we have a great show in store for you today, we're very pleased to have first-time Dealer On webinar presenter, Sean Mara, as our presenter today. Sean Mara is the CEO of ePush, a behavioral data and marketing solutions company that specializes in creating data-driven digital marketing campaigns to increase sales and market share for their dealer clients. Sean Mara's innovations in automotive advertising and marketing have sold millions of vehicles for dealerships nationwide. A 20-plus year veteran in the space, Mara founded the first web-based automotive agency and marketing company back in 1997. In 2009, he launched ePush to pioneer automotive-centric behavioral marketing data platforms, and digitally driven automotive technology, I'm sorry, advertising technologies. As a featured speaker and contributor from many industry outlets, Sean advises on the integration of dealership and market data to create a competitive advantage in the automotive arena. Sean is a respected member of the automotive community, and he can be reached at sean at epush.com. Now, during the presentation, if you have any questions, please use the question feature located on the corner of your screen to submit them. At the end of the presentation, we'll answer those questions of general interest. If we're unable to get to your question live, we're going to try to respond by email later today. And don't forget, a link to download a copy of this webinar recording will also be emailed to you later today for your reference. And feel free to share it with your friends and colleagues. And guess what? Our good friends at ePush, they're giving away an amazing prize on today's webinar. One lucky webinar attendee is going to win wireless Bose in-ear headset. Oh my goodness, this prize is valued at $250, and I am so jealous, people. You have to be on the live broadcast to win it, though, so stay tuned. And who knows, you could be the one walking away with this super cool prize today. And at the conclusion of this webinar, you're going to get a short survey. So fill it out. We're always looking for quality feedback from your audience. And we want to know what your opinion is about today's show. And hey, do you tweet much? We hope you do. We'd love to see what you have to say about today's presentation. So please tag us in it. You can use hashtag dealer on Webby. I'm at Eliana Raggio. You can also hit up Sean Mara at Sean Mara one We look forward to seeing what you're saying. All right, everyone, let's get started. Let's learn how to stop dirty data and start making more profits. Well, hello, Sean Mara. Welcome to the show. How are you? I'm good, thanks. Thanks, Eliana, for having me and Dealer On and everybody for joining us during their incredibly busy Thursday morning, I'm sure. <laughs> it and is. Cold one. So thank you so much. Now, this is your first time doing the Dealer On Education Webinar Series. So thank you so much for joining in on all the fun. We're looking forward to seeing all of the awesomeness that you're going to share with us today. So let's get to it because I know you have an incredible audience. I got a sneak peek at his presentation. It's amazing. So let's get to it. Why don't you tell the audience all the kinds of things that they're going to be learning about today? Absolutely. Thanks again. So we're going to take a deep dive today into one of the biggest yet still most undiscovered problems happening at a dealership today. It's the problem of dirty data. Now, some of you might be familiar with this content or the problem, as I just recently spoke at Cliff Bank's Awesome Autovate in Austin and several digital dealer conferences last year, and they've been kind enough to publish several great articles on the topic. One was a four-pager back in April called uh, Navigating the Dark Universe of Dirty Data. And we addressed the problem really at, at, during these speeches and sessions and articles really from a top-down macro perspective. And, it was, and we got very granular, but it was filled with very complex data models and science, data science speak. So the goal today for me was to narrow focus this on the impact at just the dealer level. So we won't talk much today about the scope and the scale globally 
uh, of the problem rather than zero in to the dealership level and how dirty data is impacting the store, what it's costing us, and how we can fix it. So the objectives today are really clear. We're going to discover why data quality should be a priority for the dealership. We're going to learn how to identify the millions of dollars in non-performing assets that are compounding in your CM right now as I speak. We're going to discover how dirty data is created, very important to know this, from, which it, from whence it came, and in the dealership and the steps you can take to prevent it. How to generate the biggest result, right, is well, how do we turn this into sales and service ROs? 10 to 12 sales and 30 to 40 service ROs in just 30 days from this call today. And that's all from dirty data. There's a giveaway, we'll talk about that at the end, and then there's going to be a great Q&A, and I'm looking forward to that. So IBM estimates, and again, I promise I won't, I won't go too far to the global, but just in the United States alone, IBM has run a report that the data quality in U.S. has cost $3.1 trillion. That's a yearly cost, bigger than some small countries. Huge. So in, the, in 2013, the last report that was reported from the, from the USPS was that 6 billion pieces of mail could not be delivered due to bad postal data. So the question is, how much of that mail was yours? Right? Processing that mail cost over $1.5 billion alone. So I'm asked all the time, what does dirty data look like? When a dealer exports it from their CMS, CRM, what does it look like? Once it gets, once it gets out of their hands and it, what it really looks like ultimately. And this is unfortunately part of the challenge of what it really is. The challenge is it's riddled with dupes, entries, typos, and the inconsistent data templates, false entries, these are errors that prevent you from ultimately connecting with your prospect, whether it's a bounce email, it's undeliverable mail, a disconnected phone. And according to Gartner, um, a recent uh, study on dirty data specifically is responsible for roughly 40% of all failed business initiatives, and it's one of the biggest threats to new businesses today. So it's not uncommon for business databases to have 60 to 90 percent bad data, by the way, you're not alone. That's the, that's, the, that's the saving grace here. Everybody that's on this call isn't doing something so wrong compared to the next guy. So time for a poll question. Yes, it is. All right, audience, we have three poll questions set for today. And the first one is on your screen now. And of course, we need you to get involved in our poll questions so we know what's happening in your dealerships and how it relates to everyone else who's on the call all over the country. Okay, so first poll question is on the screen. Let's see what it is. Do you currently have a dedicated data manager at your dealership? Please select one of the following answers. Yes, and they are an invaluable team member. Yes, we have an outside vendor doing data management for us. Sort of, it's one of his or her many responsibilities, so they don't just do data management. They do a lot of other things that's on their plate. Not yet, but we're looking into getting one, or uh, no, didn't know we needed one. <laughs> so once we have a majority of the votes in, we're going to close this poll and share the results. And oh man, this is great. The votes are coming in so fast. Audience, thank you so much for getting involved in the poll questions. And wow, Sean, wait till you see the answer to this poll question. Holy moly, not what I was expecting. Audience, keep those votes coming in. We'll have this going on just for another few seconds, and then we'll close the poll and share the results. And Sean, you can take this opportunity to take a sip of water if you want. <laughs> I do. All, right. All right, cool. All right, audience, thank you so much. We're going to close this poll now and share the results, and wowza, look at this. Okay, do you currently have a dedicated data manager at your dealership? 13% of today's audience, only 13%, said yes, and they are an invaluable team member. 3% say that they have an outside vendor doing data management for them. However, 41% of today's audience say they sort of do. It, they don't have a dedicated data manager, but it's one of his or her many responsibilities. 41%. Now, no one said the, the fourth answer, which is that they're looking into getting one. However, the majority, 44% of today's audience, said no, that they didn't know they needed one. Oh, 
Oh my goodness. All right. First of all, Sean, is this shocking to you at all? It's shocking to me, but is it is this what you've seen in a lot of dealerships is that they don't have a dedicated data manager or even a data manager at all? Well, it's interesting because it's it's not as shocking as it used to be two years ago when we stumbled upon this problem and figured it out and then created a solution to solve it. Uh, but the great news is it's good news because it's actually getting better. It's actually, there was a time where it was zero that had data management services really? or even third parties. So it's really good news and it's great to see that. So it actually warms my heart a little bit on this cold day to see people that are actually making and taking proactive steps to solve this. So it's, it's, it's shocking still, but also very comforting to see that people are actually seeing and realizing how important this is. Yeah. All right. Audience, thank you so much for your votes on that first poll question. we got a couple more coming your way in a little bit right now. Back to you, Sean. So what a great way to frame, right, that question, because that question frames everything that we're going to talk about. And again, my hat's off to the to the individuals that actually have somebody in some form or fashion. I know that that 41% that are wearing multiple hats, we got to work on that. But it really frames the, the reality of what's happening here. So I'm asked all the time, like I said a moment ago, what does dirty data look like, Sean? And when a dealer exports it from their CRM, this is what it looks like on the screen. And once we get our hands on it, it really looks like this. So it's riddled with, again, those dupes, those erroneous entries, typos, inconsistent data templates, false entries. These are the errors that prevent you from connecting with your prospect, whether it's the bounced email, the undeliverable mail, a disconnected phone, a bad address. Again, according to Gartner, that was, I'm bringing this back up, it's important, roughly 40% of all failed business initiatives, again, are the biggest threat to business as a result of dirty data. So we must think of data, most of us think of data as figures in an Excel spreadsheet or a beautiful bar chart. And these simple formats, they often hop they hide the complexity, actually, that's required to produce them. So the simple Excel spreadsheet hides the churning sea of both data, clean and dirty, that's coursing through the dealership CRM that needs to be synthesized and harmonized to create an accurate view of the truth. And that's what this is on the screen. It's the truth of what's really lying in our CRM. And we're going to get further into this now. So before we go further, how is it created? How is this happening? How are we creating dirty data at the dealership? By all the companies you, you use to provide many types of the necessary services that you pay for every day and every month. When you sign up, you're buying the service, right? In part, but you're also buying data because everything you do now literally generates new streams of data coming into what we call that grand filing cabinet in the cloud, your CRM. And everything we do literally generates new streams of data. So every dollar, this is a great, this fulcrum really illustrates it, that we spend today is generating reach and frequency, which turns into impressions and ultimately visits to both your online and your in-store properties. Now, again, all this advertising that we're, we're, we're spending turns into data in the CRM, a big percentage of it, right? We close what somewhere between 10 to 12% on average, and inevitably, a big part of the data that's left over that doesn't close, that data goes bad. Now, a lot of the data that's in our systems that ends up in our DMS goes bad, but we're not here to talk about that. But as above, so below, you can relate it across all of your data silos. I was talking to Dean Evans recently at Hyundai about this problem, and he shared with me that they close at somewhere around 7% of all the data in their CRM. Then trailing 12 months, there's a slight uptick, and an additional 1% gets closed, 8%. So again, a very big problem, and one he's also working on solving too. So this is a problem not just for OEM. It's a problem across the dealership landscape and those individual stores, because most dealers are sitting at that 10 to 12% range. We're going to talk about the implications of what that represents in just a moment and what it costs. But how do all that data end up in the CRM? It ends up getting pushed, right, from many entry points, data from third-party leads, data from dealership web properties, data pushed through the API, pearls, IVRs, sales team plugins. It's coming from all over, 
and all of these mediums, again, that we're running. And again, it ends up in our CRM. It's the entry point for all of that data for the most part. There's two types of data. This is important to classify. There's data that's born dirty, and what the way that we can help solve that is through standardization. It's one of the big issues, and it's one of the things we'll talk about today. But false entries from salespeople, not taking the time to enter in real information, putting in all zeros uh, in the zip in the phone fields, fake emails, just because well, hey, it was a required field boss. Uh, that's why I put it in there. I couldn't move to the next screen unless I put it in or the next field. That's the point. You put in the right data. So how, that's how it's born data, just a quick example, and a really common one. Never blows my mind or GM's minds or owner's minds when they talk to a sales rep and they say, oh, why is all this like this? Oh, well, we just put it in to move on. The second type of dirty data is it becomes dirty. Data is dynamic. It's always changing. It's never static. And people's name change, the last names change, they move across town, they change phone numbers, they change out emails, they have multiple emails, right? So over time, data degrades, it, it goes stale, and you have to stay on top of it. So there's two types of data, data that's born dirty and data that becomes dirty. So while there's many reasons for dirty data, these are the four most prevalent. And again, the naming convention can vary from dealership to dealership. As you see on the screen, you have dead, lost, unsold, inactive in this illustration, right? And we have tens of thousands of these. So whatever your naming convention is, it may vary from store to store. Some are marked dead, some are lost, some are inactive, but basically they all fall into this missed opportunity bucket. It's a golden opportunity bucket, really. And those are the four reasons. Now we're going to jump into another poll question. <laughs> is, that, is that the sound effect you came up with? <laughs> All right, audience. Oh, Sean, you are funny. Okay, um, second poll question is on your screen now, and heck yeah, we want you to be involved. So let's get those votes in. The poll question reads, how long is your follow-up process at your dealership before you mark that prospect? Lost, dead, or inactive? Please select one of the following answers. Within seven days, within 30 days, within 60 days, more than 90 days, or pff, we're buy or die, baby. We never quit working those leads. <laughs> All right, once we get a majority of the votes in, we're going to close this poll and share the results. And let me tell you, our audience today, they are on it. Look how fast these votes are coming in. I love this. All right, audience, thank you so much. A few more seconds, get some more votes in, and then we'll close this poll and share the results. And I, um, uh, Sean, I just want to make sure that's really what we're asking. We're not asking the entire follow-up process. We want to know how long the follow-up process is before they mark the prospect lost, dead, or inactive. That's exactly the information you're looking for, correct? Correct, because most dealerships are taught by their CRM providers, you know, to run drip campaigns, 30, 60, 90, some dealerships. I was with the dealership just the other day, uh, a large group that came on board with us that works their leads for 48 hours and their entries. That's it. That's it? And then they're, are, that's it, 48 hours. And that's not, un there's other dealerships. It's the, it's the minority. But what we're trying to identify is what, how long are they being followed up with before they actually, after the drip campaigns run out and they fall off the cliff and they're marked dead, lost, or inactive. Yep. When do they go into that inactive bucket, that silo of non-performing data? Okay, well, let's find out what our very smart audience had to say today. Audience, thank you so much for your votes. We're closing this poll now, and let's see what everyone had to say. All right, how long is your follow-up process at your dealership before you mark that prospect lost, dead, or inactive? Well, 3% of today's audience say they do it within seven days. Wow. 23%, yeah, 23 of today's audience say within 30 days. 17% of today's audience say within 60 days. The majority, however, 40% of today's audience say they go more than 90 days before they mark that prospect lost, dead, or inactive. And we have some diehards over here. 17% of today's audience say, Psh, we're buy or die, baby. We never quit working those leads. So... I don't even know if there's a right answer to this question. Is there? Or does this go towards how much dirty data your dealership probably has? Absolutely. 
Absolutely. And uh, that gets into a subjective uh, and, and process uh, a, a conversation, debate potentially, and uh, it's going to vary from dealership to dealership. But at the end of the day, to your point, the majority, the overwhelming majority of that data is going to go bad, go, going to get eventually marked dead, lost, or inactive, with the exception of that very small percentage that says they're buy or die, they're going to work it until they're going to work it forever, cradle to grave. But even data, even data for a dealership, the small percent that worked it in perpetuity, data still goes bad. So this still becomes a challenge, irrespective of how long you work the actual prospect lead or entry, right? So. Again, moving past the actual amount of time, let's use a case study to kind of illustrate the point a little bit further. So we have three case studies. We have dozens of these, by the way. These are real dealerships, real case studies. We took a five-year controlled uh, case study, and uh, Ford here on the left, Chevy in the middle, five years across the board all the way through Honda. Wow, Each I one love of these case studies. This is great. Awesome. So. All of these individuals generate a certain amount of dirty data, right, uh, that were accumulated over the five years. Ford was over 79,000, Chevy over 44,000, Hyundai over 40,000, which they averaged at Ford 1321 a month, 740 at the Chevy store, and 672 at Hyundai. Now, something that's really important is to identify what the average cost per lead is. And we're going to share a simple formula with you how to do that. but. Understanding that cost per lead, provided to us by the dealer, of course, they take the total amount of advertising, how many entries and leads make it in the CRM, divide it across, and you have a number. So that's a pretty good accurate read, the CPL. What's your cost per lead? And in this case, these dealerships vary. The average in the country is somewhere around 50 bucks. The Ford store and the Hyundai store doing really well. This Chevy store obviously paying a little bit more than the average. But all of that was investment into generating data. What's the result of that? Total dirty data expense on the left, the Ford store. Remember, this isn't lost sales or service, right? This is dirty data expense as a result of that CPL. What did it cost to get that data into the CRM? At $53 oh per entry, $4.2 million for the actual Ford store. Oh my Chevy gosh. Two Chevy 2.9 million, and Hyundai was over 1.8 million. When owners see this, they generally gasp just like you do. And they, they actually look at it and they go, well, that's a non-performing asset that's sitting on my book, book that's a dead loss. That was from a dealer's lips to my ears. And remember, these numbers don't factor in the lifetime value of the, what the LVC, the lifetime value of a customer. What are the lost sales and service revenue over the lifetime of a customer, it's staggering. The loss, and think about it, where does that loss come from potentially? One dirty record, one dirty record, one digit off, a comma instead of an actual uh, a period for the dot, right? The loss that one dirty record can cause is simply a massive black hole of lost sales and service, that lifetime value that can last for years, years. Sean, wait, I have to stop you right there. This, these numbers, this, I mean, 3 million, 4 million, this is far more than I certainly surmised. And I'm sure that a lot of other people are having mild coronaries right now, seeing these numbers and wondering how much over a five-year period these, this dirty data has caused their own dealership. And, oh, yes. God, I'm just... What? <laughs> and, and by the way, these are these are actually pretty conservative. I was in a store in a little small Lakeland, Florida, physically in the store this week, and that store had over two hundred and seventy thousand records. Dirty. Dead loss or inactive. Yeah. The owner looks at me and he squints and his lips get really pursy when he's talking to me because the last time I visited him they identified it and they called me back. I went in personally, spent some time with both the owner and the general manager, it's a group. 270,000 lost, dead, and active records. So do the math at 50 bucks a lead there. It's astronomical. Uh, another large store, uh, I can't share the name of the group there either, uh, that I was with last week, large group, over, 100, over 150,000. 150,000. So not uncommon to find that. Some are less. 
some dealerships will tell you, I don't even know if I have any data left because the CRM providers always tell me, don't bring over, when I switch out CRMs, don't, don't move the data over. We're going to get into that in a moment too. But what, what's the good news here? The good news is, is that you can recover those records like the, like the case study shows. Total recover records for Ford going through a datafication process that we're going to talk about, 53,000 records recovered. Chevy, 16,000. Total records recovered for Hyundai, 13,000. If you can get up into the 30% range of recovering your records, you're doing really good. We've helped dealerships get up over 50%, and that's doing phenomenal. But somewhere in that 30% range, with the right data sources and the right vendors and partners is really where you should be at. What did they get out of it? Well, this Ford dealership, tr going forward 90 days, was able to yield 43 sales from their dead, lost, and active. These, remember, these aren't in the DMF. These aren't customers. These aren't people that generated a service RO. These are people that were dead, lost, or inactive, growing hair on them in a CRM, sitting in a separate silo, partitioned off and not touched anymore. Recovered 53,000 of those 79,000 records and were able to generate 43 sales and 264 ROs in 90 days moving forward. Wow. The recovered ROI, crazy. The recovered, R, the recovered ROI just on the sales, just on the sales was 120,000 for Ford, 90,000 for Chevy, 91,000 for Hyundai from something that was once lost that's now found again. The old adage is always great. Uh, something I, another dealer said to me one time is kind of like that old saying about another, you know, what once was trash is now treasure. I go, you got it. So that kind of puts in perspective the, the scale and the scope of the problem and, and what it's really costing us and why we need to make this a true part of our daily diet at a dealership to fix this problem and to get our minds and our arms around it and fix it going forward. And it's a daunting task. It's not easy. We're going to talk about that. So this is that formula that I shared with you just real quickly. If you want to jot it down, it's that total yearly ad spend. It's a quick way uh, to be able to identify that CPL, total entries into the CRM, take it out over the course of the, uh, of the year, and there's your true cost per lead in 2017. It's that simple. Really easy. And it's the reason why it's so important to identify this is really CPL is a precursor to attribution. Once you figure out, figure this out, then attribution and customer acquisition, CAC, can really be dialed in. So Jim Sparkdale, who is the former CEO of Netscape, said one of the greatest things I've ever heard about data. He said, if we have data, let's look at data. If all we have are opinions, then let's go with mine. <laughs> Gut and opinion, guys, is being replaced by data. There's a place for it in today's enterprise, and that's after the data tells the true story and how you can move uh, and how you can more accurately fill in the blanks by using your gut and opinion. However, today's best businesses, most successful businesses, ha have moved away and are moving away from opinion, and it's being replaced by data. The millennials are replacing opinion and gut, believe it or not, with data because they're growing up in that environment where things are driven by data. So data-driven culture starts with letting data influence and drive decision-making. And that's a big part of creating and solving this, uh, or excuse me, solving the dirty data problem. So what's the cost? We talked a little bit. I just showed you really specifically. The direct costs are obvious. We won't spend a lot of time here. It's straightforward lost sales and service revenue, but you got to look at it from an LTV standpoint, lifetime value of the customer. That's where it becomes staggering. Indirect costs. Now, many of these contribute to that $3 trillion stat from IBM that I started off the presentation with, right? And there's a great example to drive this home, and that's one of the best, and I know a lot of people love Apple. They're the darling of the, uh, of the tech world. So... <laughs> Back in the day before they had an Apple store, there was a guy named Ron Johnson, and he herald, he's the herald architect, so to speak, of the Apple store that, was revolution, that revolutionized retail for Apple as much as Steve Jobs did. Some people may remember that name. Now, Apple stores, from when Ron Johnson came in, they exploded to over 450 stores globally, and what's more astonishing, 
As retailers, you'll, you'll appreciate this. According to a Fortune magazine analysis, Apple stores produced $4,798 per square foot in profit. Well, That's ooh. nearly 50% more than the second place Tiffany's at $3,132. So Ron Johnson, who was this incredible genius visionary that revolutionized the retail space for uh, in, in Apple with this model, went on to J.C. Penner after he was selected by the board of directors to lead the transformation of the ailing retailer. You guys probably know the JCP story. Johnson did not fare too well. The ugly truth that was discovered by a report that I read by Noel Titchy, who's a professor of the Ross School of Business at the University of Michigan, asserts that the lack of data-driven decision-making reduced J.C. Penney's value by more than 50% in just 18 months. Why? Because after arriving with his $52 million package, Johnson trusted his gut and his opinion rather than the reams of compelling data in front of him. Now, he was repeatedly shown focus group results, clearly indicating that consumers had a strong preference for discounts. Johnson pressed ahead with the changes, mandated fixed pricing, the ensuing confusion and customer defections were at the heart of the company's 25% sales drop. It plummeted. But Johnson didn't stop there, you think he would. He not only ignored the existing data, but he was so convinced he didn't need a new information to value his righteous strategy because guess what? That's the way they always did it. That's how they did it at Apple. He ignored the data. The data is in your CRM. Don't ignore the data. And again, this can be applied across your entire organization, but the indirect cost of going on gut and opinion, we're talking about employee and customer dissatisfaction, increased cost of operations, poor decision making, lack of, comp lack of confidence within the organization, and difficulty executing organizational strategy. Data drives all of those things. Data can impact all of those things, and I'm gonna get into more examples as we get more granular in how we fix this problem. And I hope that example really drives home about ignoring the data and going with your gut and opinion. So a recent experience study of small, large enterprise reports, 22% of the companies are, are investing as, uh, between 100 to 50, uh, 500K a year, 22%. Now, the good news is some of you in that initial poll actually factor into this you have a line item for a budget for data management services. So proud of you, impressive. And it's great to see that people are, that, that's gonna continue to grow. If we do this webinar in a year, I bet you those numbers will skyrocket. So now bounce that though, and look at those numbers originally that we saw over 40% didn't even know they needed one. So the reality at a dealership, here's the dichotomy is that dealerships are spending hundreds of thousands of dollars and in many cases millions to get the data in every year and virtually zero to manage and maintain the data. Mm. That's just crazy, right? So how do you turn data quality into a competitive advantage? You start by running a simple query. Remember, I told you I was going to keep this very narrowly focused on CRM today. Okay? You can apply a lot of this across your entire organization, but we're going to really focus on CRM because it's easy to be narrow focused. So first thing you got to do is you got to run a simple query. And the nomenclature, like I said earlier, can vary from store to store. And you can have your CRM administrator or, or, or whoever, marketing manager, internet manager, CRM provider, run this when the webinar is wrapped. Some of you will probably do it multitask right during the webinar. And you'll know the number in minutes. And yes, most likely, like Eliana was, you'll be blown away at the massive opportunity sitting on your shelf that's just growing a funk and hair on it. So we want to, in that old CRM files, we want them all. You want to identify everything. Missed opportunities, dead, inactive, everything. You can actually even do this on your active prospects, but if you're focusing on that dead loss and inactive where that big loss is going to be, that giant black hole, then that's where you're going to see the greatest opportunity. So first thing is to run a simple query. Let's know and identify how much dirty data we have. Full question. Full question. Can I steal that? <laughs> All right, audience. Third and final poll question is on your screen now. I know now we're getting into the nitty gritty of it. We want to know when was the last time you 
ran a query or a report, however you want to call it, in your CRM to identify dead, lost, inactive, and unsold leads or entries. What, I mean, there's a lot of different nomenclature here, so we tried to include them all. So when was the last time you ran a query in your CRM to identify those dead, lost, inactive, or unsold entries? Let's put it that way, all right? Please select one of the following answers. Did you do it in the last three months? You do it every quarter? Awesome. Did you do it twice a year? Do you do it once a year? Or how about, I really can't remember the last time. It was so long ago. Or... Uh, never. I didn't know I was supposed to do that either. Once we get a majority of the votes in, we're going to close this poll and share the results. I have to say, Sean, this is really, really interesting stuff, but you're scaring the crap out of me at how much money these poor dealerships have been losing just from this one thing. It's, it's unbelievable to me. By the way, we also have some great questions that have already come in from the audience. So audience, keep those questions rolling in. We are here to help you with your dirty data and help you clean up your act. So get those questions in. I, it was funny because, um, Sean, I don't know if you knew this, but in the description for this webinar, I called you the doyen of data. So if you want to, like, you know... Uh, Put that in quotes every time your name is mentioned. I totally think you should do that. Um, <laughs> I will give I will give you credit three times for it, Eliana. That I'm going to own it. <laughs> oh, and that's it. All right, <laughs> all right, audience. Thank you so much for your votes. We love that you're getting involved in our poll questions. All right, Mr. Mara, are you ready to see what the audience had to say on this last question? Absolutely. Let's do this. <laughs> Somebody said they had to look up what Doyen meant. <laughs> you were so funny. All right, here we go. When was the last time you ran a query or report in your CRM to identify dead, lost, inactive, or unsold leads or entries? Well, the majority, 35% of today's audience, said they did it in the last three months, and they do it every quarter. Boom, I love it. 9% of today's audience say they do it twice a year. 6% of today's audience say they do it once a year. 26% of today's audience, so roughly about a quarter of today's audience, say they really can't remember the last time. It was so long ago. And 24% of today's audience, again, about another quarter, says they didn't even know they were supposed to do that either. Whoo, that's a lot of people. So basically half haven't done it any time recently. Is that what yeah. you're expecting? And what is the right answer? How often should we be running this report? Am I getting ahead of myself? I don't want to steal your thunder. <laughs> you are not. You are not. The stats were great having them on the screen. Uh, I don't know if you could put them back on there real oh, quick yeah. for everybody. But that 35%, that really, I got my hats off to everybody that's in that bucket. You're, 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 to answer your question, Eliana, that is at the very minimum, right? Every three months, once a quarter, I'll tell you what, I can I can accept that all day long, and we can have a lot of success with that model. That's fantastic. Again, my hat's off to them. The twice a year, the once a year, let's get you guys up to every quarter. And then the ones that haven't done it, you got to get started right away, and you got to get out and just start with and, be, and, and set a goal and a budget to do it every quarter to answer your question, Eliana. The ones that 50 plus percent that have not done it, get on a quarterly program and and just start every quarter, and you'll be perfect. This is great. So really great news there. So continuing to really create a great frame. So for those that don't do this, and hopefully the ones that do do it, you'll get something out of this. So we talk about what dirty data looks like, and as you can see in the screen, this really now really begins to, to dial it in for you. So step one is you got to run that report in the CRM and identify, and this is really especially for those 50% that haven't done it, and identify and export the file with all the inactive, incomplete, and even the inactionable files, and go back as far as you can go. I mentioned earlier CRM providers sometimes give dealers bad, bad, uh, bad advice when they're switching over. A lot of dealers switch over CRMs, and they say, oh, well, you don't need to put this data in there, and it's on a, believe it or not, I've had dealers say, I got it on a disk. It's on the cloud. It's in a. It's it's partitioned off in the new CRM. Um, it's on a. It's sitting in an Excel file in somebody's file in their computer somewhere. Go back as far as you can. Go back to every single piece of data that you have because it can be recovered and reanimated. Step two. We have to locate once we once we identify and export the file. 
we then can locate and identify all that missing information, those dupes, those erroneous entries, the misspellings, the bad addresses, the misspellings, and the emails, and all the other issues with that data set, right? Because what do you have? You have corrupt records. You got har you got to harmonize short codes. We talked about harmonizing data earlier. One guy writes one guy wrote, writes uh, 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 road. Another one writes state. We got to create some consistency and harmonize that across that data set. So once you have the clean and correct, uh, and uh, once you once you have clean and correct this data, which is the next step, once you've identified and located all the errors, now you have what's called a hygiene data set, and you actually have the ability, as you can see on the screen, you have a comma where there was a, a dot, you have a zeroed out, you have the city spelled wrong, you have zeroed out phone numbers. You got to clean and correct that data before you can do anything with it. And that's where it starts to get very exciting. Hey, just clean and correcting it would be a great start if that's all you did. You'd be able to at least, to some degree, market to these individuals with a piece of mail at this point. So wait a minute. You mean to tell me that if um, one person puts in 208 11th Ave and another person puts in 208, 208 11th Avenue, that, that just that one difference would make it a corrupt record? No, 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 not at all. It's it's just getting standardization and harmonize and, and you know harmonizing those short codes, right? So if your company's gonna you want to have protocols, data protocols, so things are consistent with how you do them. And that comes into creating a data dictionary. That's later in the actual session. We'll get to that actually very shortly. But um, you want to have some consistency there. That's not going to prevent it from getting there, Avenue versus Ave. But that's, again, harmonizing a short code in that, in that particular scenario. And that gets into data protocols and having discipline and training your people to understand the way you want the data inputted, the way you want your vendors to input it. And we are getting a little ahead of ourselves, but I hope that answers the question. Yeah, but, I mean, are you telling me that there could be one crappy um, uh, salesperson, not a crappy salesperson, but a s salesperson who has crappy typing skills uh, who could really, like, cost our dealership a lot of money? Absolutely, by just simply fat furring a comma. This email is not going to deliver. It's just not going to deliver. Right. So, so what happens if Aspen Smith doesn't receive that email in real time? And for those people that said they follow them up uh, within seven days, they send an email. It bounces. The phone number wasn't put in right because we didn't have it. So the guy zeroed it out. The BDC can't follow up with them. We send them a piece. We can't send them a piece of mail because the zip code's not accurate. Right. So does that become a lost sale, a lost service RO? Does that become, does that impact because somebody rushed through it or just made a simple mistake? Like you said, they weren't crappy. They just, they were, they were, they were rushing through and they hit the wrong key. Jeez. All right. Let's keep moving. <laughs> you got it. So the next step, once we get the data clean and corrected, is to actually match and link, right? We want to be able to uh, validate records against known data sets, correct de records that are partially match existing records, right? And you can use a multitude of data providers and even big data and additional data sources to do what we call operationalizing your data to gain opt-in compliance. So the reason is so important and mission, this reason is so important and it's mission critical for two reasons. You want emails that don't bounce and a lot of dealers don't know what I'm going to say, is after 60 days without express opt-in consent, you legally can't send somebody an email just because they ended up inquiring about torque on an F-150 or because they ended up as a sales inquirer. So after 60 days without express opt-in permission, you can't continue to market to that person legally. Now, there's not we know there's not email police out there, but there is class action lawyers, and there is individuals that do get really worked up and, hey, why are you emailing me? I told you not to. Next thing you know, you email an attorney or somebody. So you really got to be careful. This is not just about dirty data and what it's costing us in sales and service. This is also being in compliance with the, with, with the rules and the, and, and the opt-in and the compliance laws, anti-cam spam policies, by having active data. And here's the other thing. Once you clean and correct that data, you have to be able to get an opt-in email, which is why you have to utilize a, a, an alternate data source unless you send out an opt-in offer to that individual on the email you had 
and you get them to opt in, because let's say it's five years old, and that, that, that last file was five years ago. Ultimately, that person has to be able to opt in and you, or have them opt in with an actual um, uh, known data set where there's an opt-in, an opt-in email that you can now ongoing market to. And that's going to come through additional vendors and data sources to help overlay your data, which leads me into the next slide, which is how you enhance your data. Once you have that organized data set, it's been identified, it's been cleaned and corrected. Now you can enhance it with things like behavioral data and really ramp up its targeting and performance. And getting that opt-in email so you can market to it again is so important, and most importantly, it's legal. So some great data overlay examples, as you see on the screen, credit, VIN, behavior, income, profession, all of these things, and there's so many more, you can add on to create a really robust data set to really pinpoint your marketing, social media profiles, all kinds of things you can do with this data to make it more uh, to make it more effective and perform. And all of this is going to help lower those inefficiencies and increase it, effectiveness and efficiencies and lower ad spend and waste. Because now you're you're get you're actually able to communicate with somebody based on their profile, their buyer persona, which we're going to talk about as well. So we have to raise our standards, right? So we're on the fourth step. What goes in must come out. Garbage in, garbage out. We've heard that in the data business. You have to dictate the data template and the mapping you want your vendors and or any input of data for that matter to have some standardization at your company. What's helpful here is to create a data dictionary and some data protocols that you can review with your employees uh, weekly, daily, and begin to weave this into your culture to become a data-driven culture. But it starts with creating a data dictionary. What do we expect? What do we look for? And what does this mean? And what are the protocols that we want not only us, but our vendors to follow when they push data to us? So uh, create data profiles. So asymmetrical information, right? As you know, a file is asymmetrical. Data forms relationships through standardization from the profile from asymmetrical data forms. So data profiling can be formed, this type of what I'm referring to, there's software programs like IQ Insight, First Logic, and SQL, or similar programs that can help you do what I'm showing here on the screen now. So take, this is, again, taking your data to a whole nother level, and it's going to take it to a whole nother level of performance. So again, data profi profiling can be formed with software programs like IQ Insight uh, from First Logic, uh, SQL, or similar. So it's time consuming. It takes an ongoing effort. It's constant monitoring offering. There's people that we were in that, those buckets of people that do it every quarter they know. It's a data-driven culture. This is what it requires. To be, and it needs to be part, like I just mentioned, of our daily, weekly, monthly diet. It's a mindset. So don't expect what you don't inspect, and that's why just like you have those meetings for sales service, you got to have meetings about data. And you got to monitor and audit this ongoing like this great group of people that are doing it every quarter. So Edward Deming once said, this is another great quote I love, without data, you're just a person with an opinion. So this is how what we've talked about today, data becomes a weapon. And when I say data driven, I'm talking about dealerships that operationalize data. The implications of employing this process benefits and increases results across every aspect of a dealership. There's just five areas of uh, five areas that we can operationalize our data on the screen, building bu bu buyer personas. And I'm going to get into each one of these here. But something that's not done by dealers is using clean data, then combining it with good old-fashioned surveying, so you can identify the many different buyer personas that are actually buying cars from you and servicing cars. So you can market their type of per, that persona with much better data going forward. And that's a whole nother seminar is how to create a buyer persona and an actual an understanding who's buying from you and how to market to that subset of individuals, the persona, right? A millennial, a Gen Xer, a baby boomer, so on and so forth. So the best dealerships will employ predictive scoring. This is number two. These are technologies that crawl the web, they aggregate data about potential customers, they calculate the likelihood a customer will close, and each morning a dealership can log into their CRM to a list of prioritized by likelihood to close. 
These are the Glengarry leads. Segmenting prospects with predictive scoring is critical to success, but if you do it with bad data, you've wasted your money. Three, modeling existing customers. It's happening every day in Facebook, right? We're taking our data. We should be taking our data and uploading it into Facebook. Yeah, the Oracle Data Cloud's great. We're a whitelisted provider of theirs, but guess what? You could take your, your dead loss in active data, take it through this process, upload it in the CRM, and you'll be blown away about your CPC dropping precipitously, your engagement going up. So you can clone your existing customers and prospects and those buyer personas to, again, increase effectiveness and engagement while lowering costs. So it's simple on four, better data, right? Better data, accurate data equals a better customer experience in so many ways. One-to-one -one personalization is going to be a buzzword you're going to hear it, it, the, of content and offers. It's a real solid, good example. It's something all marketers should be striving for. The tech's not completely there. There's very few companies that are getting close to one-to-one -to -one personalization. It's going to happen. It will happen soon. But uh, there. But the data, the better your data is, you can make strides towards that one-to-one -to -one personalization, which is going to increase results, right? So very important. If you have, you know what they say, you can't polish a turd. That's why you got to <laughs> get this dirty data under control. Wait, you can't? <laughs> you cannot. I haven't so tried. Five, <laughs> instead of regarding data, guys, as a retrospective report card of a team's performance, data informs the actions of each employee at every single level in the organization. Operationalization, my, my that I, mantra that I live by, means changing the way a company operates in the afternoon based on how the data, based on the data they got in the morning. A good example from a dealer was, you know, uh, they they had a they had a a, a, a a really busy morning in the service department. Lots of people sneezing, coughing. It was cold out. Uh, several people uh, sent in emails. Hey, you know, you guys should do something about the. There's no there's no hand sanitizer. So what happened? By lunch, they had a hand sanitizer uh, dispensing unit there, and people were happy. I know it's simple, but that's the way we change our businesses with the data we get in the morning to the data in the afternoon. That's how we drive decisions by data. But none of this can happen with dirty data, especially as it relates to the CRM, which we focused on today. So the one big payoff here, guys, is better data equals better decisions. Better data equals better targeting. Better data equals better results. And better data equals less waste. So the way that we do that, we can grow our email, right? As we, as we run through this process of dirty data, we're going to grow our opt-in list and our email list, lower bounce rates, improve inbox deliverability, increase conversion, increase one-to-one -one personalization. Instead of sending a blanket ad, send them the ad that they're most interested in, which was the black vehicle that they looked at earlier that day, right? That's where we're heading, but you can't do that with dirty data. Direct mail, growing your list, NCO certifying it to cut down on waste and making sure it gets there. And you can send out less mail when you got the right mail going out, right? Social media, using your own data to drive down CPCs. We have dealerships that spend 10, 15 cents a click because they're using their data. That showed brand-specific narrowness and dealership-specific narrowness. They just never landed on a model, but they ended up in the CRM five years ago, three years ago, two years ago. They were dead, lost, or inactive. Now you're retargeting them on social media, and the, the, the numbers that we have coming back, we have, we've had social media companies tell us, big ones in the industry, that our data is performing better than the Oracle Data Cloud. Not for me because the dealership took a proactive step to take that data and to begin to hygiene and append and to datafy and go through this rigorous process, not only once, but ongoing. BDC, growing your list, gaining DNC compliance, making sure you're calling the right people, increasing connects, right, which increases your, the attitude and the morale of the people in the BDC. Nothing worse than melting into your seat, calling people you can't get a hold of, and a lot of disconnected numbers, right? Mm -hmm. So the implications of solving this dirty data problem affect your entire company. So again, this is how you can test and measure against this, with this data against other sources. Attribution goes up, 
and what once was lost again is now found and becomes a major part of your business. So I'm wrapping it up here. This is a clear and evident correlation, and I hope everybody got that, which is the clear and evident correlation between data quality and higher performance is not even in question. We're in a very exciting time right now in the history of corporate computing, guys. Organizations are beginning to wake up to the fact that the data they collect and manage should be viewed as corporate assets. That's what it is. No ifs, ands, or buts. It's the only thing that separates competitors since they don't know how uh, they don't know how each other are leveraging the critical information, but ultimately the quality of your data can be your competitive advantage or your disadvantage. The choice is yours. A data-driven dealership is a culture, guys. It's a mindset. It's a habit. It's a discipline, and it takes work. Work that's never going to end. Training, education, not just once a month, weekly, maybe even more. Start uh, And start in little 15-minute sessions to slowly try to feed the elephant in one bite at a time to your staff because they got to become educated, and they have to become data-driven, or it all falls apart. Create a data plan, right? Create a data dictionary. Focus on standardization, requirements, and expectations, and consequences that are commensurate with the financial losses at stake for your dealership and possible legal recourse your dealership faces when employees don't comply, and they don't do what they're supposed to do because they're too busy, or they didn't want to fill in that field or a vendor didn't map what they were supposed to map properly and pushed a bunch of crap into your CRM. Hmm. Don't expect what you don't inspect, right? Create programs and incentives. Here's a cool thing to do to report with, with a Starbucks gift card, right? Reward employees, an Amazon gift card. Talk about and uh, live a data-driven mindset and the actions that will foster a data-driven culture. So in closing, guys, this must become part of your operational DNA and understand that the CRM data fabric weaves together many parts of your business. It's up to you to make the data your competitive weapon because bet your butt, your competitors are. Now's the time to act and be one of those data-driven dealers that I talked about at the beginning that's going to be winning over the next two to five years. Here's some great suggested resources. This is awesome. This first one, guys, get this link. This is a calculator that we created that will help you find out how much dirty data is costing your dealership. And you can literally, it's a slider. You just slide it in. It's so cool. It's kind of, we kind of got the idea from the car business, right, hmm. how, to, how to figure out a payment. This will help you figure out really quickly how much data is sitting there and how much is, it's costing you. We had a great white paper just been revised and updated. You're going to love it. That's one of the resources we're providing today, included in the webinar. Thank you for joining. It's our way of saying thank you. The calculator, the white paper, and you can learn more about the data uh, and power and influence that is in our lives in our five videos and additional blogs. The link is there. It's all free content. It's all available to you. Take it. Be a good steward of it. Share it with your friends, your, your dealer 20 partners, uh, and anybody you care about that's in business to help them get a data-driven mindset. So the action items, identify the amount of dead, lost, inactive, and missed opportunities. To calculate and identify the dollar amount of the dirty, and three, assign a budget to fix and master it. Four, use multi-channel efforts to market it and mine it and yield returns from it immediately within 30 days or less. Change your culture to become a data-driven organization. Again, weave it into that organizational DNA, constantly monitor, manage, and mine it. Start putting those posters up in the break room, things about data. Start putting those posters up. Start talking about data, sharing data and information, because the biggest companies, Google, Facebook, all of these, Zendesk, the thing that they do is they've created data-driven cultures where their employees can access this data at the levels and accesses that they're granted at any time within the company. They have all access to the giant brain and all the data. That's what your employees need to do. and They've got to be able to access good data to make good decisions and to yield the most from it. It never ends. It's constantly 
going to be something you're going to do in perpetuity. These are your action items. Eliana, I can turn it over to you. No, I think you have one more. Oh, our special offer. <laughs> so, we are, so we are offering 30% off your first three months of our CRM reanimation product. And feel free to reach out to me directly. We'll have a, a conversation, no pressure, no obligation. Uh, but we want to see more dealers end up in those buckets where dealers that are already achieving success and already doing this. We want to help you guys get there, get into that bucket. So 30% off your first three or months, it's very substantial. We don't discount, uh, but we, only because of Amir and Ali and the team at Dealeron and how much love they give us. Uh, we wanted to help you guys out. So thank you so much. I appreciate everybody's time. And if you want to take advantage of the offer, at least talk about it and what and what we can do for you guys as far as addressing the dirty day problem with our CRM reanimation product, reach out to me personally and I'll work with you individually. Awesome. I love that it's called CRM reanimation. I like that name. All right, good. Um, Sean, I learned so much today. I can't say I learned, uh, you know, because I've been doing this a long time. You know, I can't say that I learn a lot from every single webinar that I host, but I certainly did today. Thank you so much for bringing us such a really incredibly interesting topic. I really love this. Audience, I hope you Got loved it, it too. Um, we are going to, if you could go forward a slide, that would be great. And then we, uh, you know what, I'm going to turn on my webcam so you can see how excited I am about this. <laughs> Sean, you are more than welcome to turn on your webcam too when you're ready. Audience, if you haven't gotten in your question yet for Sean Mara, wow, that is, I am much bigger than I wanted to be. Sean, <laughs> where the hell is the PowerPoint? <laughs> is it there? No, it's just me on the screen and no one wants to see that. <laughs> uh, it's I actually, just so you know, I have it on, and I have my webcam on, I believe. <laughs> no, I can't see your webcam. Okay, I see your webcam, but now we can't see your screen. So, all I see is your webcam. screen web now? I see your webcam now. Hey, hi, Sean. <laughs> uh, hold on, let me just turn it off. I hate to do it. I know you don't want me to do that, uh, but there's something that's tripping it up. Can you see the presentation now? No. I still only see me. I'm so sorry, everyone. <laughs> Dave is so kind. He's like, you look amazing. I was like, oh, thank you, thank you. Okay, well, while you're trying to fix that um, presentation and get that back on the screen, uh, Dan wanted to know, does ePush deal with Canadian dealers? We certainly do have a lot of people that are not in United States proper, so um, we even have people from other countries here. So can you help people who are not in the United States, by the way? Uh, we would have to have that discussion. It's it's possible. Okay. All right, Dan. It's possible. It's possible. So we're gonna get back. We're gonna circle back around to that. Um, okay. So audience, we have some great questions that came in from you. Thank you so much. We're looking forward to getting to those questions in just another moment or so. If you haven't gotten in your question yet, now is the time. Let's do this. All right, get in those questions. We're looking forward to a really nice, robust Q&A session with Sean Mara. Now, before we do that, I do want to direct your attention over to the handouts section of the GoToWebinar interface. So on your GoToWebinar interface, look pretty low you know, like below where you would put in the questions and look for the word that says handouts. There's a little triangle next to it. Click on that triangle and in there you're going to find two great handouts for you. One, of course, is today's slide deck. So if you'd like to download that and have all of those notes directly in your hot little hands, that's where you would click to download that. We also have a really wonderful ebook slash white paper available for you. I know Sean had mentioned it before. It's called, it's called Turn Your Dirty Data into a Competitive Weapon. So you can download that immediately, like I said, and it's available to you until the very end of this broadcast. So if I were you, I'd take a moment to do that now. And if you have any problems whatsoever downloading either or both of those handouts, then just email me directly at eliana at dealeron.com and I'll send them over to you, all right? Okay, before we get to any of that awesomeness though, 
We have some fun stuff to take care of, don't we, Sean? I know a lot of people are really excited sure. about this. I included. And I was wondering if there was any way I could pretend that I was a attendee instead of the moderator for this event so I could have a <laughs> shot at winning this. Unfortunately, the answer is no. I can't win this prize. But you know what? You can. So let's go to the next slide. If you were here at the beginning of the webinar, then you heard me announce that our good friends over at ePush giving away an amazing prize on today's webinar. One, only one of you lucky webinar attendees is going to win a wireless Bose in-ear headset. Dude, this is so cool. This prize is valued at $250, and I am J.E. Ellis, people. Only one of you can win it, and <laughs> their name's not going to be Eliana Raggio, I can tell you that. So get to your keyboards, get ready. First person to answer the, to give us the correct response to the prize question is going to be walking away with this awesome prize today. Now, and they are awesome. They, they are awesome. Dude, I know. If you have a spare set laying around, I live in New Jersey, okay? Um, by the way, if you're a vendor, we love having you on the Dealer On webinars. Always, always, and you're always welcome. But we're going to ask you to kindly sit this one out. This prize is intended for dealership personnel only. So thank you so much for that. All right, here we go, everyone. Good luck. And by the way, if you win this thing, I need you to quickly write on in. Let me know what dealership you're from so I can give you a proper congratulations, all right? <laughs> yes, I know. <laughs> Hashtag vendor lives matter. Absolutely. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Here we go. Good luck, everyone. I hope you're paying attention. What did Sean say was the formula to calculate true cost per lead? What did Sean say was the formula to calculate true cost per lead? Let's see. <laughs> Okay, guess what? We do have, you know what, the very first person who wrote in, let me see, you, it's been, that is correct. The first person who wrote in actually did have the very first correct answer. Max Nunn, congratulations. You are the winner of today's amazing Dealer On giveaway. Congratulations, Max. All right, Max. He wrote in total yearly ad spend divided by total entries into the CRM. Congratulations, that is correct. That's how Sean calculates true cost per lead. Congratulations, Max. You are with Volkswagen of St. Augustine. Now, don't forget, Max, I also need your um, mailing address. If you do not provide your mailing address, he will be getting the mailing address for someplace in New Jersey because it will be coming to me. So, Max, make sure you get in your mailing address so I can get that prize out to you. It's actually coming from our good friends over at ePush. And uh, now, listen, I know for the rest of you out there, your name wasn't Max Nunn, was it? I know, neither was mine. So, you didn't win the prize. Over. I know, I know. But you know what? We give away cool prizes every week on the Dealer On webinar. So come on back to another Dealer On webinar, and that might be the day that you win a great prize for today, though. Max Nunn is the big winner, so congratulations to him. And, of course, we got to thank our good friends over at ePush for their incredible generosity. So thank you very much, Sean. Okay. You're welcome. Yeah, he's lucky as fast joining. fingers, I know. <laughs> congratulations, Max. All right, let's get to some of these amazing questions that we had from the webinar attendees. Let's put it on the next slide, Sean, if you wouldn't mind, so people have your contact information. Look at that great headshot. Got it. Thank you. Okay. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Um, okay. First question came in nice and early from Sharpie. He says, what is it for real, and what do we have it set at in the CRM? Okay. When it comes to dirty data, is there any way to mitigate the damage, Sean, as Sean is asking, I'm sorry, as, as Sharpie is asking, by doing some certain settings in your CRM? Is that something that can be done, or this is just, hey, report, and it's hands on the keyboard making this go away? Well, there's, well, remember, data, data entry points come in a lot of different ways, right? The data is coming in through APIs and pearls and there's a lot of there's a lot of entry points into the data, so it's not just about somebody sitting there putting in the information and putting it in wrong. Of course, that's going to happen. Human errors. That's why dirty data never stops, right? Because there, there's going to be the human uh, the human element to it that is going to unfortunately create this problem ongoing. It doesn't ever solve itself because we make mistakes. I mean, with just the way that it goes. But we can work where we really and but that's part of training too. Slow down. Put the right information in creating that data dictionary. So yeah, you can mitigate it. Not a setting, 
you got to set the human by training them, unfortunately, and get into their wetware and kind of uh, reprogram them, the individual, uh, about your data protocols and your processes, what you expect, and how you expect the data protocols to be met, the standardizations. But they got to know where you want it, how you want it, and that they can't just skip fields. And if they do, they and if they and what fields can be skipped, which ones can, and not to put in erroneous information just for sake of putting it in. So that's a that's training and it's getting into the wetware of your employees and helping them. So unfortunately you have to train them to get that setting to stick, right? When it comes to your CRM though, um, what can you do? Well that comes down to data mapping and uh, sorry about the screen there guys. <laughs> At least can we you... just lost the screen. We didn't lose you. <laughs> that's right, you didn't lose me. But can you uh Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. So, sorry about that, guys. So, um, technical difficulty, right? So, the CRM itself is about standardization and mapping and how we can do things uh, with our vendors. And again, it comes into that data dictionary and those protocols to help mitigate and lessen the data coming in incorrectly, right? That. But again, data can be born dirty even coming in. So, there's there's ways to correct it, but it gets into, and I'd love to talk to Sharpie offline and uh, get a little bit more granular on that, but ultimately it's again working with standardization and mapping and really getting those data protocols in place and having that standardization across the organization and how you work with your vendors. Fantastic. And Sharpie did write in. He said, that's a good answer, Sean. I would have to agree. Thank you so much. Um, we're going to be, uh, oh, <laughs> he says, everyone wants to talk to Sharpie offline, LOL. <laughs> <laughs> I know I do. All right. So thank you so much, Sharpie, for the great question. If you have a follow-up, well, we would love to hear it. Okay, next one comes in from Greg. Greg says, what lead providers tend to have the best, I'm sorry, tend to have the highest CPL and the lowest? And which one do you feel is the best? Oh, he's putting you on the spot, Greg. <laughs> I mean, Sean, Greg is putting you on the spot. Where did you go? Are you here? <laughs> I'm here. I promise. I haven't gone anywhere. I'm just. Uh, I, I. I. Well, it wasn't really a technical difficulty. Besides, I was absent-minded and didn't keep my computer plugged in. Oh, so I apologize. Geez. But that's okay. It's booting. It will boot back up momentarily. It just needs to get a little bit of a charge. But I'm on. You can hear me. I apologize for taking the wonderful screen of my picture away from you. Um, so I'll have to deal with my voice for now. Okay. So, uh, well, you know, that's a subjective. I think it's a subjective answer. You know, there's so many great lead providers out there. There's so many great companies out there. And, you know, we all know there's subpar ones out there. But, you know, ultimately what you convert, because it comes down to a question of what are you converting more of, right? So, you know, I know dealerships that might, might, might do an incredible job closing true car leads, but the other dealerships in the same area don't do a great job closing them. So it's really subjective. Uh, there's great companies out there that are generating leads. There's so many. I, I hate to leave anybody out, but I can tell you that that comes down to the quality. Um, since we're talking about the quality of a lead versus the quality of the data that's getting pushed in, again, it's subjective. It's going to have to be determined by what is the dealership really converting from that those leads coming in. And then there's so many variables to that, right? who's getting those leads and how are they being worked and how long are they being followed up and so again it's very subjective it varies from dealership to dealership and you got to kind of each dealership has to look at the providers they have and how they're performing for them specifically even as compared to another dealership in another market or in the dealer 20 because what works for one dealer may not work as good for another dealer and one dealer may say, I don't like that company. I don't like their leads. I didn't get anywhere with them. And another guy says, they're the greatest things in the world. I love them. I close 30% I close of them. I close 15% of them. So, it's, again, it's very subjective. Uh, and, and just so you know, um, we have some great comments that came in from one of our attendees. His name is Philip. Philip says, the best leads are the ones you generate yourself from your own website or your own online digital advertising. I would have to agree with you, Philip. And uh, he goes on to say, um, okay, now just so you know, Sean, by the way, I see your screen's back up. Yay! Okay, Sean, 
Do you, I mean, how could you not? It's indelible in my mind. That that slide that you had that showed the losses that those three dealerships yep. were dealing with? Okay. So when that happened, during that slide, Philip had written in and he said, another intangible loss from dirty data is when your sales and service staff waste their time trying to connect to all of those bad files and the loss of productive employees and their time. Philip, yes. So that number really is even more than just all of the, the cost per lead. So thank you so much for pointing that out, Philip. Now, very uh, yeah, very sharp. Okay, next question actually comes in from Philip. He says, <laughs> since crap in gives crap out, is there now or in development any real-time filter that can cross-reference the data as it is entered to reduce bad data? Any AI that can be applied to accomplish that, again, now or in development? Anything that you've heard of? Well, we're, we're actually working on something exactly like that. It's not ready for release or even beta yet. Um, that is a great question. There, there's really no, not, not that I'm aware of any tool that's going to take it before it makes it through the gate uh, at the entry point into the actual uh, CRM that's going to take that data, pull it out into a separate silo, um, you know, hygiene it, append it, right. bounce it off of different data sets. I'm not aware of any, any tool that's doing that that's off the shelf. Um, it could be created individually at a dealership, but no, I'm not familiar with any, anybody that's offering that. But we are and we do work um, not as a widget or something that we sell, but as the data comes in that we, that we take in from our behavioral data platform, EVE, we're using that data to actually verify and actually the, the accuracy and the level of accuracy is a big part of us taking offline and online data and merging and con or converging those two worlds of what online behavior is happening and then with offline data to, to increase the accuracy uh, and validity of that data across multiple data sets. And that gets into how that we use our data waterfall and we use this um, ecosystem mm -hmm. of data providers that even as a data uh, marketing services company we use as well um, this data waterfall which is kind of one of our uh, proprietary ways that we do a lot of this is that we actually take that data and run it over a data waterfall to increase that accuracy to, to somewhat of an answer to Philip's question and that allows us to have much more accurate data real-time data um, that becomes again ultimately deliverable and accurate, and that increases results, that increases effectiveness, and lowers ad, wa uh, ad spend and waste. So um, we work and do those things, but not in a front-facing product now where we license it or sell it right now. Right. Okay. Great answer to a wonderful question. Thank you so much, Philip, for that. Now, Sean, um, we have so many great questions that came in from the audience, which I love, but we're going to have to make the answers a little bit quicker, if you wouldn't mind, sir, because we are already are over time, and we don't want to lose anyone, and we want to make sure we try and get to as many questions as possible. Also, could you go back one slide so people have your contact information available to them? That would be very helpful. So thank you so much, Philip. Great question. Okay, let's get to another great question. This one came in from Erin, and she just wants clarification on this. Erin says, is Sean saying that a lead marked lost, as in a customer is no longer in their current buying cycle, is that automatically dirty data? I am not. Was that short? <laughs> <laughs> Why, yes, uh, yes it was. <laughs> yes. Uh, again, naming conventions, naming conventions, again, fluctuate from dealership to dealership. So there's dealerships that mark something lost, that gets marketed differently, right? So, so the, because it changes from dealership to dealership, what we're really looking for is that inactive lead, right? Just to use maybe the, uh, the, the nomenclature we would wrap around, it would be inactive. An inactive lead that's not no longer being marketed because a loss could be a lost sale, right? To, to her question, right. um, which or any clarification that she's looking for, and they may keep working that with drip campaigns. They may have different follow-ups they do with somebody that they lost. You know, hey, we want to get you back. Can you please come in? We 
we love you, we got great deals, but ultimately that lost sale could become an inactive uh, entry or lead. Okay. Thank you, Aaron. Great question. We have some really good questions that came in. Um, for instance, Mark, hey Mark, I know you've been waiting. Mark says, are some DMSs better at identifying dirty data than others? I haven't found that to be true. Interesting. Okay. Now we know. All right, Mark. Thank you so much. Um, Okay, Mark did have a follow-up question, too. Mark says, is the e-push process, I assume he means the CRM reanimation, um, is it similar to running records through the national change of address file, the NCOA file? Good question. That's one of over 32 different data points that we use. Ooh. But that's a critical one, absolutely. You have, to, you have to do national change of address, but that's just one of over 32 different data points that we actually run that data through in the reanimation data five process. Hot diggity, all right, great questions. Thank you so much. All right, back to Greg's question. He's not letting you off this, by the way. He was the one right. who wanted to know what lead providers have the highest CPL and the lowest and which one is the best. And then after you gave your answer, he wrote back in, he wants to know based on the data, not on your opinion, which one is the best. So I don't know if you had that data available or I, do we I have do. an answer for Greg? <laughs> Yes, I, that's, a, that's fantastic. I want to meet Greg immediately. <laughs> but, uh, Greg, I do not have the data to give you uh, an answer of who is the um, best C, uh, provider of a lead with the best CPL. I do not have that data. No. Okay, then don't answer the question. Good, good job. Smart move. All right. Um, <laughs> Greg said thank you for humoring him. So thank you so much. Great uh, question. I love it. Uh, and just so you know, Sean, I don't want you to get put off by this. I tell people if it's their first time on a dealer on webinar, you got to ask the tough questions. All right? So Greg was doing just that. <laughs> I told you. I want to meet Greg. I like Greg. <laughs> I want to meet him, too. All right. Here we go. Next one came in. Let's see. Amy is the next one. She says, this might be the most uninformed question ever. <laughs> <laughs> but how do we revive the, this dirty data once we have identified them? How do we revive it? Okay, so if I understand the question, it's once you identify it, right, once we locate and identify all of the records, we have to clean and correct it. So th that first step in reviving it, and if I think if I understand the question, is mm -hmm. to clean and correct it. That's the very first step, right? We have to get all of those fields and harmonize those short codes. So we have to get, you know, uh, um, you know, uh, Frank Frank Smith at one two three Anywhere Street uh, with uh, Frank at Gmail dot com mm -hmm. and his phone number. We have to clean. We have to clean and correct that data because it could have been incorrect in the example that we showed earlier. So once you do that, that's the first step in reviving it. Then it goes into all those other steps about what you can do to enhance that data and how you can get that data compliant and, and, and uh, uh, append an actual opt-in email to it and so many other overlays to make that data an organized data set that you can then begin to market the revived data or reanimated data in this case. All right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do the follow-up question, Amy. You, you just sit there and, and watch my fire. Okay, Sean, i got a question for you. The, um, the, the CRM reanimation that you kindly offered for 30% off for three months, it's awesome. I'm just curious. First of all, if one of our attendees went right now and started to try and clean up their data act, right, how long would it take that one person, full-time, eight hours a day, whatever, and how long does it take the CRM reanimation that you offer, like to go from dirty to clean, like a dishwasher? Good question. Got it. So when 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 we work with the dealership, again, we're always at the mercy of how quickly a dealership moves. So as quickly as we receive that 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 CRM file that's exported, we don't go playing around in anybody's CRM. It gets exported. It gets put onto a, a, a secure share site right. and we take that data from that secured sales site and again it's csv uh excel format we take that data 
and then we begin the datafy process. And that's what our internal coin term is, datafy. Our datafy process, from the time that we receive the file, we will we will be marketing to that data within 14 days or less. Ooh. Okay. All and, right. And and give the dealer back the data because we don't just take the data, datafy it and then market the data, we actually then give that data back to the dealer so they can then put it back into their CRM uh, and have that data that's been reanimated. For an individual to do it on their own, again, it depends on uh, expertise, it depends on know-how and knowledge base. You gotta go source the vendors. It's not just one vendor that, that, that does all of these different aspects that we talked about today. There's lots of vendors. It can become very cost prohibitive without the scale. So it just, again, it can, I mean, it's, it's a subjective answer because, you know, it could take, I, I know people that have tried it and then called me th uh, three months later and said, man, we've tried to do it. I'm ready to do your program just because I, we can't do it. We can't put the time into it. And I know very sharp people uh, with the right resources internally that have, that have done it and put it together in 30 days and uh, began to start the process for themselves and then you got to learn by doing and fail your way to success and right. it's going to you know there it's it's a never ending story and it's always something new to learn and vendors change and data changes and so it. it's it's not something that you set and forget okay follow up question to that did you just make up the word datafy i'm pretty sure you did all right here we go <laughs> Thank you so much. Great question, Amy. Thank you so much for bringing that to us. Okay, we still have, uh, I mean, more than a handful of questions left. So let's keep going. And um, we're just going to ride this thing to the wheels fall off. All right, next question, Sean. This one comes in from Eric. And this is a really interesting one. I, and I dare say, I don't think Eric is the only one who has had this problem. Eric says, I've changed CRMs a couple of times in the past seven years. And I don't have all the data in my current CRM. They only transferred my active prospects. What can I do? Basically, he's asking if, if he's screwed. <laughs> does, he, does he even have dirty data? Can he get it? Can he still make money off of it like we talked about uh, earlier? Absolutely. It happens all the time. It's unfortunate. I hate to see it. I hate to hear it. But... Uh, Eric doesn't have to feel alone and like he's the only guy that this happened to or he did something wrong. It happens a lot of times with CRM providers, especially as they switch from one provider to the next. And the answer is go back as far as you can, whatever you have available. And it doesn't even make a difference. I said earlier, I made reference to, we had a dealership one time say, I got it on a disc. And okay, send us the disc, no problem. <laughs> or put it on the disc and, to, and export it into a CSV and get it to us. Um, it, it makes no difference how old the data is. It makes no difference how many, what format it's in. Get it all and work with that data because all of that data can be uh, mined and it can be hygiened and appended and it can be right. datafied. And uh, you can have a really, really big new ocean to, sw uh, to fish in once you actually take all of that data from all of those years and all of those different uh, changeovers to CRMs. So oh, as far yeah. back as you can go. Yeah. Oh, good, because uh, actually Eric had a couple follow-up questions. He said, if I can recover those files, can you use that, and how far back can we go? Uh, the answer is as far back as you can. And you can use go all back. of it. And you can use absolutely. Now, that doesn't mean, let me just put the disclaimer, that doesn't mean it's all going to be, uh, you're going to be able to recover and reanimate all of it, right? Remember we talked about 30 plus percent. We we are somebody somewhere in the 37% file efficiency ratio where we can take a file and our efficiency ratio to recover those records is around 37%. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's higher than uh, average, but the reality is is that you're never gonna save everything, right? Because if you just give me a name and a first name and a zip code, we can't do anything with that, right? We're not miracle workers. but what we can do is we can recover sometimes up to 50%, but on average somewhere in that 35 percentile will be able to recover those records. So give us all the records, go as far back as you can, uh, and uh, don't discriminate because there's okay. opportunities in there. Okay, okay. I like, I like where this is going. All right. Thank you so much, Eric. Great questions. I wish you the best of luck. And 
as you can see, he's awfully good at what he does. You know, if you want to reach out to him, he's a super nice guy. Um, okay, next question comes in from Vicky. Vicky says, I'm pretty sure my CRM provider offers services like this. Is that enough to solve my dirty data problem? Question, Vicky. So most CRM, well, first of all, CRM providers aren't in this business generally, right? So that's not the business they're in. So, but most most CRM providers might do an append um, and and some basic hygiene. Take advantage of it for sure. You should definitely be doing that. Um, but the reality is is that they're they're definitely not taking that data. And if you remember the different slides that we rolled through where we began to datafy mm -hmm. and enhance that data, most CRM providers are not doing that. And then the other big rub comes in being able to market that data from a mass marketing standpoint, right? So having the right deployment pipes to be able to get those emails into the inboxes, um, a lot of CRM companies run into challenges there right? Uh, where they can't get those emails out for in, in large batch quantities with high deliverability and that's just not the business, first of all, it's not the business that they're in. So you know, there's two sides to that, right? So very limited hygiene, which is very specific, very limited hygiene generally provided by CRM providers and then going beyond the hygiene, well, once you hygiene it, how do you enhance that data? Most CRM providers don't provide that and then how do you market it effectively ongoing and most CRM providers don't do that either, of course. Um, especially when it comes to the emails and getting them into the inboxes. Okay. All right. Thank you. Great question. Thank you so much for that one, Vicki. All right. Just a few more questions, so we'll get to those real fast, and then we'll start closing out the show. Okay, Sean? Yes, absolutely. Okay. So remember when you talked about emails, like sending out the emails, and you said something that a lot of people, it struck a chord with them. So, for instance, Arielle wrote in and she said, so we're not allowed to email or call after 60 days following an inquiry with no response? Like, I think you had said something to that effect, and that was kind of shocking for Arielle. And she's not the only one. Jennifer also wrote in, so how does a customer opt into the email? Does a reply to an email count? So I'm curious, first of all, is there different... Um, laws depending on which state you're in and what sure do you is. know that we should know about opting into an email? <laughs> yeah. Well first yeah the, the most obvious answer to the question is how do you opt in? Well you guys everybody's opted in before where there's well you'll see it will say uh, you want where you're checking a box that's opting you in to receive ongoing communications mm -hmm. from the company. And then you'll see the you know the the second box will say do you want to receive additional offers from our partners, right? So a single opt-in from a dealership saying, hey, we want you, we want to continue where they're subscribing to communicate with you as a dealership. An inquiry is totally different than an opt-in subscriber. So that's why like the ESPs that like the constant contacts and the MailChimps, you have to actually subscribe. And if you try to take a list and upload it to one of those ESPs right. where they're batching out tens of millions of emails a week, right? you can't just take a list and give it to them. They want to know when did that person opt in, right? So that's the same thing. Just because somebody inquired, dealerships do it all the time. They take a bunch of emails, they try to deploy them, they end up getting blacklisted. Those individuals have to opt in to receive ongoing communications. And yes, an inquiry is totally different. Got it. But, uh, yep. Okay, Ariel, Jennifer, thank you so much for the question. If you have a follow-up, we're here for you. We'd love to get to it, but make it fast because we only have a couple more questions left. All right, next one comes in from Tara. Tara says, Sean, you mentioned defining a monthly budget for data management. What's the range if this is something that we've never done before? What's a good budget to set aside for data management, Sean? Good question. It is. So... Yeah, it's really good. And again, it comes into, um, you know, how large is the dealership? You know, how much are they spending a month in advertising? How many units are they selling per month? There's so many factors into that question. So I'll just simply try to quickly answer the question that to get started, um, I would venture to say that a few thousand bucks a month uh, is a fair number. That number could grow over time, right? So using a third party, I don't uh, recommend going out and hiring somebody that's a 
sixty or seventy thousand dollar year data person right mm -hmm. out of the gates. Um, we have a slew of data services here in our at our company, and they're they're expensive. You know, they're not inexpensive employees. Um, and so don't necessarily go out there. So using third-party services, you could go out there and you could probably count on spending a few thousand dollars a month to start. And that's a really good number, to, uh, a safe bet and, and a fair number uh, that's palatable. Yeah, but and when get you, you results. I was going to say a, a couple thousand a month when you see how much has been lost and how much you could actually recover. My goodness, it doesn't really sound like that much at all, actually. Okay, great question. Thank you so much. All right, last question, then we'll start uh, uh, closing out the show. This one comes in from Brad. Brad says, I'm already marketing to my customers through my CRM. Why would I need to spend even more money? Well, Brad, <laughs> let's see what Sean has to say. <laughs> That's another great question, and a very common. There's a there's a, there's a subtle thing there called customers. I'm already marketing to my customers mm -hmm. because CRMs allow you to market to your DMS customers, right? So what I'm hearing Brad saying is the word. I'm hearing him say customers. We're not talking about customers. Number one, very important delineation. We're not marketing to the active prospects. You're already doing that with your CRM provider. You're paying really good money to market. And to, and, and to return the highest amount of sales that you can from your existing prospects that are active, as well as your customers, which are people that are buying from you already or servicing from you already. So very big delineation. We're talking about the dead, the lost, the inactive prospects that are no longer being marketed to and haven't done business with your store. So, so very important. We're not talking about customers and we're not talking about active prospects where that data is going to be fresh and you're going to be able to reach those individuals. We're talking about the dead, the lost, the inactive, the unsold that are no longer being marketed that again uh, are sitting in a separate silo basically going stale or have gone stale. All right. Big difference. Thank you so Thanks, much for Brad. pointing that out. Thank you, Brad, for the question. All right, um, before we start closing out the show, I want you to know, Jody, who sat in through, she's still here, uh, sat in for the entire show. She said, I didn't know if I really needed to attend this webinar, but boy, oh boy, I'm so glad I did. Very valuable information. Thank you. Thank you, Jody. Thank you. Um, we got another great one from Chad. Chad says, thank you, Eliana and Sean. I'm in Edmonton, Alberta. Solid points that can't be argued. Five stars. I like it. And well, thank you. last one came in from Rick. Rick says, Eliana, this is my first webinar with DealerOn. What a great experience. You made it fun and informative. Great job to both of you. And Sean, I couldn't agree more. Fantastic job. First time out on a dealer on webinar and you nailed it. Thank you so much. Great, great Thank topic. You. And I hope you'll come back sometime in the future and give us some more great ideas on how we can clean up our act when it Thank comes you. to data management. We'd love to have you back. Thank you. I would Thank love to. I'm honored and it's a pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. All right. I want to remind the audience a link to download a copy of this webinar recording is going to be emailed to you later today. For your reference, please feel free to share it with your friends and colleagues. Today's webinar is also going to be posted online within 24 hours. Go to DealerOn.com slash webinars to view our upcoming webinar schedule or access any of our past webinars too. Also, this webinar is going to conclude in just a moment. You're going to get a short survey. When I say short, it is short. It is three questions, my friends. Please fill it out. We're always looking for great feedback from our audience. I loved it. But no one cares what I think. We want to know what you think. So please fill out those three questions. <laughs> Thank you, Sean. We want to know what you thought of today's presentation. And hey, are you losing valuable traffic because of slow mobile site? Well, that's no good. Google estimates that well over half your website traffic is coming from mobile devices. Don't worry. DealerOn now offers a mobile site speed test for free. You can get yours uh, just by applying for it during the survey. That's one of the three questions. All you have to do is give us your URL and let the magic begin. Great way to see how your site stacks up to the competition. And invitations will be going out tomorrow for our next Dealer On webinar. Oh, it's a big one too. It's our very first ever Twitter webinar. All these years I've been doing webinars, never had a Twitter webinar, but you know what? We got you the goods straight from the big house. That's right. Twitter strategies that sell more cars. Twitter is what's happening in the world. When it comes to automotive, on average, there's over 1,400, I'm sorry, 
146,000 tweets per day with the intent of just, I need a new car. Wow, that's a lot, 146,000. In addition to the number of people tweeting, there's Polk DLX data that shows that there are over 12 million in-market car shoppers on Twitter every month. So if you're not using Twitter to connect with car shoppers, you're missing an enormous opportunity. If your dealership has been holding off from fully utilizing Twitter, then wait no longer. To find out about the Twitter strategies that sell more cars, we're bringing you all the goods direct from Twitter. Chad Rumminger from Twitter will introduce a variety of different tools and tricks that will take your Twitter campaigns to the next level. In this exciting one-hour webinar, he's going to discuss in detail what's new and hot as well as trends on Twitter that you need to be ready for in 2018. This jam-packed session is designed to show dealers the basics in advertising on the platform while also showing how to successfully connect with consumers through Twitter. So if you're ready to step up your advertising game and have the highest levels of marketing success on Twitter, then don't you dare miss this must-see presentation. Register now. And don't forget, Dealer On's weekly webinars are held Thursdays at 12 noon Eastern, 11 a.m. Central, 10 a.m. Mountain, and 9 a.m. Pacific. Uh, we lost your slide, Sean. If you have any questions, comments, Sorry. or suggestions regarding our webinars and our topics, <laughs> feel free to connect with us directly. Again, my name is Eliana Raggio, and I am everywhere online. You can find me on Facebook, Google+, Twitter, you name it, I'm everywhere. Or you know what? You can just email me directly at eliana at dealeron.com. I'd love to hear from you. Thank you so much, everyone, for spending this time with us today, and I hope to see you all on another webinar in our continuing education series. Take care everyone and go Eagles!